Thank you for uh, coming here uh, today um, uh, through this inclement weather uh, that we had just a few minutes ago, and uh, but it's uh, now nice of you to be here. Uh, we're so fortunate um, uh, to have uh, Robbie Diamond here, uh, who's the founder and president and CEO of Securing America's Future Energy Safe uh, that he put together uh, starting in 2006 uh, with help from uh, Fred Smith, chairman of, and CEO of, uh, of uh, FedEx, and, uh, and really putting it together to be a, a force in Washington to uh, really uh, look at, uh, at basically uh, our energy futures and, uh, and making it, uh, appropriate decisions in Washington uh, to help uh, us uh, reach better futures. Um, it's so wonderful to have him uh, come here and, uh, and speak uh, on um, uh, self-driving. Actually, I think it's what I call driverless, but you know, we'll, we'll worry about um, terminology or whatever, and we won't argue with him. But uh, um, uh, are we on the autopilot uh, for the future, uh, which uh, at least um, some of us think is a transformative technology that uh, can really uh, go and, 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 and uh, fundamentally improve the quality of life of, of an enormous number of people as well as, uh, as a society as a whole. So uh, um, I welcome, please, um, um, uh, Robbie Diamond. Uh, so happy to have you here with us. Thank, thank you, Alon. That was uh, thank you for hosting me last night for dinner. Thanks for a great meeting before, and uh, thanks to everyone here for a meeting with me. It's been a totally I'm turning on my clock. A fascinating and enjoyable uh, time, and uh, thank you. So, um, first of all, if this is a great lecture, uh, you'll all be here because you hear lots of stories uh, when everyone says, "I wrote it on a napkin." Well, I really did write it on a napkin. <laughs> So let me know if I should save the napkin or I should just burn the napkin. Um, so uh, self-driving, are, are we on autopilot? Um, so basically the question is, are we on a clear path to the future or we will we hit a wall? Um, before directly answering that question, uh, let me take you on a little journey of oil. Because as you heard, uh, we do care about uh, the impact of oil on our society. So. Um, first of all, in 1850, so these will be a lot of pictures and a lot of dates. I'll talk very fast. There are a lot of slides, and I'm happy to stop and answer questions later. It starts here in 1859, uh, Titusville, Pennsylvania, really the first uh, industrial, uh, industrialized oil well. In 1901, Spindletop, Texas, we find a lot of oil. Now, that sets the stage um, you know, for a new oil economy in 1886. We have uh, Benz invent uh, the internal uh, uh, combustion engine, um, and he patents, patents the gasoline-powered auto. Um, now, thank God, I guess, at the, about that same time, we found oil here, which is the first oil that was found in the Middle East in Iran. Um, in 1908, good thing they found that oil, the Model T starts rolling off the line, changing society as we know it. Now, big decisions are made because of oil, and this is maybe one of the biggest. In uh, 1912, Churchill, he makes a revolutionary decision. He decides to turn the British fleet from uh, coal power to oil, um, which is a better propulsion mechanism. They can go farther and they can go faster and giving them the advantage. This is the HMS uh, Queen Elizabeth, which is the first oil-powered um, battleship. Now, of course, when you suddenly um, you know, depend on oil to fight your battles, you have to figure out where to get it. And if you're a country that has a lot of coal and no oil, you've got to start um, owning oil companies around the world. Well, 1914 is uh, ushered in oil into the theater of war. Um, these are, uh, this is a transitional war going to a mechanized uh, conflict. And we are, uh, these are uh, troops defending, British troops uh, defending the Abaddon uh, oil refinery from uh, German and uh, Turkish invasion. Um, I'm just going to go through, event, uh, through some events. Um, now, in 1919, oil overtakes kerosene as the, uh, as the propulsion fuel. And uh, at that point, there's just no looking back uh, in the oil future that we live. Now, um, oil also causes uh, many, many wars and determines uh, who wins and loses those wars. 
Now, uh, many people, uh, you know, just, I mean, I think people just don't think about it all the time, but really, this is uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, really, Pearl Harbor, why the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, one reason was because we had an oil embargo on them, and they, uh, that, that drew the Americans um, into the war. Um, now, here, this is uh, Adolf Hitler, who said, unless we get um, Baku's oil, the war is lost. And that's actually Adolf Hitler cutting a cake that he was given uh, with the Baku refineries because they thought they would get the refineries. Now, this entire battle for Baku led them to Stalingrad, which was the first major loss of the Germans and started to be uh, maybe uh, arguably the beginning of the end. I guess that speaks to the fact that you can't have your cake and eat it too. Ta -da. So, uh, you know, this is another major battle. I'm, I'm getting somewhere. Uh, the Ploesti refineries in Romania. So actually, this is the U.S. bombing that. Um, it is actually one of the costliest um, battles, uh, of Air Force battles and losses of the U.S. Air Force in, uh, in, in history. Um, they lost, um, it was called Operation Tidal Wave. They lost 53 aircraft and 66 airmen. In fact, they, they, they went there because they were trying to get rid of, uh, you know, Germans getting the oil, just as the Germans were racing to Baku to get other oil. The truth is they actually didn't really stop any of the flow of oil, but that is what drove their decision. Now, this is important for uh, Uber and Lyft. Uh, apparently, conservation in oil, um, which was first seen as critical in 1943. Um, you know, I wonder what a uh, ride pool would be like uh, with, with friends like those. Um, I haven't actually shared it with them yet. I've got to send that to the CEO. Um, now, the instances, okay, before I go back, the instances at this point, you know, they're just incredibly geographically diverse and they, they, they're everywhere, a lot of wars and in Central America and other places, just people fighting for energy, of course. Um, I'm just going to run through the highlights, mostly focused on sort of a very U.S. perspective. You know, in 1953, we have a coup d'etat after the Iranian parliament decides to nationalize all the oil companies, and the U.S. government doesn't really like that, so they install someone called the Shah of Iran. Now, uh, that eventually led to these guys. That's been a thorn in America's side uh, for a while. And they like to threaten closing the Straits of Hormuz, where a huge amount of oil uh, goes through. You'll read about it right now. Um, as they continue to threaten that. That's where our troops are deployed. 1956, the Suez Canal crisis. So two thirds of European oil went through the Suez Canal. That is why when it was nationalized by Nasser, um, uh, the Prime Minister of England couldn't allow that and he uh, attempted to take it over. Now that botched attempt to take it over really was the, you know, some could argue the really the beginning uh, or the end of the end of the British uh, you know, empire and really where the United States started taking the role of oil security in the world. Um, in 1973, many people might not be alive. I wasn't alive actually, so uh, I was just an apple in my parents' eye right at that moment. Uh, the the uh, get oil embargo, which I think really seared in America's mind that uh, there is an oil dependence problem. Now, you have, up to that point, see, America was producing enough oil. Like in 1967, after the Six Day War in Israel, um, and they tried to have an embargo, America just opened the taps. At this point, America could not just open the taps um, and therefore uh, created this you know, incredible um, crisis. And it really, actually, I think created the political moment uh, for what America does in its foreign policy. Um, you know, there's something called the Carter Doctrine, which basically is uh, President Carter who said that we will defend oil at all costs, um, you know, around the world. That was uh, the Rapid Reaction uh, Joint Task Force, which became Central Command, which went from two generals to maybe 30 generals, and we'll go through that in a minute. Um, we, we, we all know uh, this country and lots of countries around that area, but just uh, on the side, you know, the Iran-Iraq War, really over oil in the beginning, Saddam Hussein wanting to take uh, control of the oil markets, believing if he took over Iran, creating a terrible war, the first Gulf War. Um, as uh, President Bush himself said, we weren't there for broccoli. Um, and that led, of course, to uh, arguably 9-11. You know, Our troops are stuck in Saudi Arabia, uh, creating problems. And then the second Gulf War um, it's itself. Um, and we still have troops there right now. A lot of blood and pressure, treasure um, really expended on this problem. Now, it really uh, props up a lot of bad people in the world that don't share our values. We'll list some of them. Of course, we've got Vladimir Putin. Actually, the, uh, the defense budget of, uh, 
uh, half the budget of Russia is oil. Uh, John McCain once commented that oil was, uh, that Russia was essentially a uh, gas station. And, uh, and the truth is, is that if you look at their military expenditures, they correlate almost perfectly to the price of oil at that time. So when oil prices are high, they have much more money to uh, create problems around the world. You know, some of these people are dead, we've got Saddam Hussein. Uh, the point is it doesn't really matter who's there. The country they lead is essentially creates a dictatorship. It is called the oil curse for a problem. It's not good for us, and it's really not good for them. Um, we've got Maduro uh, coming off of Chavez. Um, you've got the Saudi family. They uh, like to take reporters, I guess, and chop them up and lead them in bags back to their country. Um, now, why are we there? Why do we care? Um, you've got uh, Teodoro Obiang of Equatorial Guinea. Another great person. Uh, Gaddafi, no longer there. But, uh, you know, when uh, only 800,000 barrels of oil came off of Libya uh, during uh, the revolution, the price skyrocketed by $30. It does not take a lot. Um, and then here's Sani Abacha of, uh, of Nigeria. So if you actually look at this, big oil is not actually big oil. So many of us, you know, consider when uh, oil prices go up, they call the oil companies to the CEOs to go to Congress to swear that they're not causing the price to go up. And as you can see, the largest private oil company in the world is actually ExxonMobil, and it's way down the list of all these national oil companies. And from uh, a safe perspective, um, you know, it's really uh, a question of um, it's not a fair and a free market, right? They manipulate the market, they, uh, they, uh, and, and so this is a big problem. Like, certainly we don't have transparency and everything else. Now, there are other problems I'll get into in a minute, but... I think that's really an important thing to understand how the oil market really works and uh, why we care about these countries so much. And really, uh, honestly, about uh, MBS in Saudi Arabia, one could say that his whole plan to change the country might be that he actually sees some of the technology on the horizon. Some of them, McKinsey showed up. They said, you're in big trouble. People aren't going to use your oil in the future. You better figure something out. And, um, and so they said, oh, we're going to you know, change our society and create a productive economy. Because right now, most of these countries live on rents. You know, they make this money, they buy off their, uh, their uh, the people who want to uh, overthrow them, and we continue um, on. Now, remember, they also, when the price is low, have a problem themselves because they need to meet their budgetary needs. So uh, that's why you begin to see uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, Russia clawing back oil from the market. I would just say that, and I'll get to fracking in a moment, but I will pre prelude by this by saying, yes, we produce a lot of oil in the United States of America, but the price of oil is a global price. If uh, we just became the number one producer of oil in the world, and yet, uh, two weeks ago, Secretary Perry is running to Saudi Arabia and running to Russia to basically grovel for them to put oil on the market because they want to put sanctions on Iran. Is that the position the Western world wants to be in? Is that the flexibility we want? Let's take a moment and talk about movement of goods. It's a little bit of a detour from uh, the main thing, but this is uh, very important and it will all tie together at the end. So it is very expensive to move things on land, bulk things, right? Most of history, bulk movement is on water. So, uh, you know, they had, uh, well, first of all, the, as I said before, the Roman merchant horse cart, you can kind of see, they go five, 10 miles an hour, they have capacity, very incredibly small. You then move to a Roman merchant uh, galley, um, of course, it's a little better. It can go four knots. It's got a, it can carry 150 tons, right? That's the difference between water and land, right? But that, of course, determines empires. How big could Rome really grow? What could Rome really do? You could take this chart and look at China. You could look at any ancient empire and really determine um, its, its ability to grow or what it does based on its ability to move goods. So, of course, this was a big change. The gallon, which is a speed of eight knots, um, capacity of 500 tons. Well, what does that create? That creates empires. That's, these are all European colonial powers um, at the time. So uh, let's just skip to there. And um, steam trains is actually um, the first time we had successful movement of goods, of bulk goods on land. Um, not even close to what was going on before, but that's in 1804. I know I'm jumping dates, but this is sort of a different uh, uh, land. But this is critically important. This is the first uh, bulk transit on land. Now, of course, things have changed radically. The containerization of the world, I could show you how much cheaper it is to go across the Atlantic, even just in a ship, um, versus the containerization, but this is not the point of the talk. So I'm just giving you a sense of how things are rapidly changing, but the movement of goods is so important to countries, empires, and, can, and everyone else. Now, trucks um, you know, make, a, make a big difference. Um, 
but the truth is they don't actually carry, they carry bulk goods, they've made it more flexible for us and everything else, and you know, uh, truck travel has grown exponentially and continues to grow, but as you'll see in a moment um, in the chart a little, a little later, um, you know, it's really only 45 miles an hour, it's 20,000 20, uh, 20, tons, it's not really you know, the, the, the movement of an incredible amount of bulk goods. So I asked the question, um, is this really the best we can do? Right? I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty sad. Uh, what does this cause? Causes congestion. It's pretty terrible to get places in a lot of the world. Uh, parking. It's lousy to find a parking spot. It's expensive to park. It's expensive to uh, find a parking spot. A lot of empty capacity out there, right? A lot of people, one person in their cars, got other seats. And essentially, uh, I don't know the exact number. A lot of people here might. But it's something like 2% uh, of actual energy uh, is used to move the human in a car, right? The thousands of pounds of cars, the inefficiency of uh, combustion. Um, and then when it all comes down to it, your 150-pound, you know, 200-pound person is only 2% of the energy of the usable energy. And of course, there's environmental risk and, uh, and damage um, that we, we see. This is uh, the spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and I would say that we have national security concerns, but I think I just spent the entire time talking about that, so I'll just say and national security concerns. So it's a pretty bad, pretty bad world that we've invented for ourselves. On the other hand, it's amazing, right? I mean, people I mean, can live where they want, they get around, might be annoying and everything else, but it's inexpensive. Oil is tremendous. Tremendous. That's like, I think some people try to take out oil or think they can just you know, convince someone to go get an electric car. Like, look, it's like the greatest thing. It carries a lot of energy in a very small packet, and you can uh, transport it everywhere. Like, as someone once said to me about electric cars, it was a great line. Uh, they said, you know, the great thing about electric cars is they're great cars, but they got lousy energy. Where uh, oil is great energy, and it's just got a lousy car. Um, and I think that's the dynamic we want to all solve for here. So what is going to change the world? So in 1997, this is our sort of uh, fracking is invented in the United States. Uh, George Mitchell. And uh, this is the beginning, as I said, we've just become the largest oil and natural gas uh, producers. Now, from my perspective, as I also said before, it's not actually, um, in some ways it's to radically changed things, in some ways everything's exactly the same because of that global price, because of the manipulation of price. Um, but important to note, it is, uh, you know, it's something. Now, there's a great book called uh, Saudi America uh, by Bethany McLean that just came out that really talks about how low interest rates actually drove this change. Yes, there was a technological revolution, but it was the ability of companies to get a lot of money. Because when you frack, I don't know how many people are experts in fracking, it's really much more like, I mean, some people call it like it's an industrial process. It's not like finding big pools of oil and using it. It's really you know, like a straw sipping, I guess, in your Slurpee at the end of uh, the Slurpee when you need to get the final piece of ice. Um, now, in 2008, important, uh, might not be the sexiest car uh, ever, uh, but it did beat the Tesla. It's the first mass-produced electric vehicle. Okay, that's 10 years ago, nothing. In 2009, Uber and Lyft uh, launch. That's pretty, uh, that's not a long time ago either. Just remember the fuel economy standards, which I'll come back to, that President Bush and the California are currently fighting about, didn't even know about Uber and Lyft. And that's when Obama was president of the United States. Now I'm gonna put in two slides for people with graphs, uh, just because I wanna look like I do know how to have a graph, um, but also because uh, I think they are quite telling. So since 2009, so uh, this is the, T and taxi ridership. Just look at the speed at which Uber and Lyft have taken taxis business. Now they had a terrible competitor, the taxis that are totally not sympathetic to so many people. But uh, it's not only what they took away from them, but look how much they've grown the market. And that's everyone who says, well, I'd rather just leave my car in the rather just leave my car in the drive. I don't even need a car, right? I don't know how many people here have licenses. Uh, I hear that people don't get their licenses as quick. My 16-year-old is currently getting her license, so uh, that's, uh, that hasn't changed. Um, and then the other one is travel reimbursements. Look at that. So these are people who fill out their expense reports. Uh, one day you'll all have the luxury of doing that. And you say, where I spent my money? Well, Uber and Lyft have overtaken both rental and taxi companies combined. 
you know, that is a scary thing if you're enterprise, Alamo, et cetera. And like I said, it's the speed. So it used to be when you came to transportation, you know, take fuel economy standards. You'd get a higher fuel economy standard, a more efficient car. You'd get one mile a gallon a year. That would take, you know, 10 years to get to the whole fleet, 10 to 12 years. Like it was like a slow process. This is not, this is a revolutionary process in transportation. That's never really happened before. In 2010, you have the first driverless car on public roads. Now there have been 10 million miles driven by Waymo, right? I mean, eight years. Um, Alan is here. Uh, what year was the, uh, was the DARPA challenge? Uh, 2004, 5, and 7. Right, so in 2004 and 5, a car could not drive with no cars around it in a desert more than 70 miles like the, the winning car went. It couldn't even finish the race. In, 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 in 04, it there you go. Um, another book you should all get is Autonomy by Larry Burns, a really great book. He was part of the uh, DARPA challenge. He was the head of research and development at GM, who then paid for, um, for uh, the team over at Carnegie Mellon, boo, to, uh, to, uh, to win. Alan, sorry about that. Money. Money makes the world go around. But uh, you know, I just think it's really an incredible, incredible thing. And now, what's going on now? Um, this micro-mobility revolution, right? Now, I am not saying that that is going to be the end story. Um, it's probably not, but the truth of the story idea is, is that your cell phones here, um, you know, have that lithium-ion battery. Most people don't drive more than, uh, you know, a certain distance, and that this, it will be in a different form factor, maybe for all weather. Um, and then the question is, what do you do with them? You know, I live in Georgetown, Washington, D.C., and they call it bike junk. Um, like, are these not bike lanes anymore? Are they micro mobility lanes? You could, um, in fact, I've seen data that show that car companies could make more money selling miles through uh, micro mobility than they could actually big building the cars that, and selling the cars that they do today. But it's a, it's a big difference. Now, why does this matter? There's this great virtuous cycle. Uh, I like talking about military things, as you saw in the beginning. This is like a force multiplier, and a force multiplier of the free market. It's these three things that go together. It's the idea of autonomy, the idea of uh, sharing, and elect electrification, electric vehicles. And that each one, from a business perspective, reinforces the other, which will drive each of them faster. So the best example would be if you are Uber and Lyft, for example. Uh, you say to yourself, okay, I want, uh, I want to own, I will, I'll own a fleet. I will, don't want the, co the highest cost as the driver. We want to remove that. And I also want uh, the cheapest fuel and maintenance. 80% less fuel and maintenance costs on an electric vehicle. So that's it. That's uh, 10 cents a mile they could probably provide of an electric shared vehicle. 10 cents a mile. Just so you know, in public transit, it's about a dollar the government gives to subsidize a trip in a heavily dense area. It's about $7 a trip that they do in an area like Richmond, Virginia. So you could give free miles, and the government could still come out ahead. That's incredible. And uh, on electric, well, why, is it autonomy, why does share matter? Why does autonomy matter? Well, it matters because um, you know, right now, uh, people buy their car for this like one trip. You know, I'm going up to Lake Tahoe to go skiing, and therefore I need this big car and whatever. But most of the time, as I showed you, it just sits empty, and we just drive air um, and drive heavy metal through through. But here, if you begin to think of rides as algorithms, well, then I can have 30 mile cars, 60 mile cars, 100 mile cars, 300 mile cars. Um, they probably won't even look like cars. But that allows you to save cost in the battery, not only the 80% cost, but, uh, uh, but also the cost in, uh, in how it's uh, designed. Um, on autonomy, I'll just answer this question up front. I mean, there's still like a big debate going on about um, does the um, autonomous uh, computation uh, to make it drive, and I'm not an engineer, I don't even play a good one on TV. Now, many people here are real engineers. Um, you know, the question there is like, uh, do you need so much power that it will take all the power out of the cars? The answer um, is to TBD, but uh, I think a lot of people don't think, uh, don't, uh, don't think so. And remember, the, uh, the chips have not been you know, designed yet. You know, they have not been maximized or, uh, for, uh, for efficiency of this. They're just beginning this uh, fact. But over 60% of cars that are self-driving are currently electric. 
So who benefits from autonomous vehicles? So, well, first of all, we all benefit. I'll go through that. But I, there are groups of people whose lives will be forever changed in the way we live in our society. I believe that autonomous vehicles, if it happens and this whole thing happens, um, will be the greatest change since the Industrial Revolution. Absolutely, in my mind. Senior citizens. Clearly, a hard time getting around. Now, in, there's a big problem in the United States and other countries. It's called uh, the urban, uh, it's called elderly orphans. They bought homes in the 1950s, 1960s, in places that have no property values today. You took away their keys because they can no longer drive. They're, that's it. That's over for them. You know how many people say to me when they uh, think about driverless cars? It's actually the, it's the, it's the um, boomer generation that says, like, I just took away the keys from my parents, and I really don't want that to happen to me. Well, disabled veterans, some of the same disability community. You know, for example, my daughter um, has a wheelchair. And it's a profound difference when you live with someone like that or you have those problems yourselves to understand what they have to go through. Buses stink. Air, transit stinks. Um, calling them wait, you have to hours. There are people who don't leave because they don't know what time they'll be picked up or if the elevator in a subway system will work or not. We did a study that showed two million people who currently cannot get jobs because they're stuck at home could be employed. Low-income households, this is uh, Alon's uh, you know, big thing, and I think it's totally true. Um, if you look at uh, where people live and their access to uh, the ability to get to a job, it is, it is dreadful. Uh, you can't get people to a job. That is, that, that is actually a big problem. It's, uh, it's their ability. Uh, bus routes don't go to these places. People don't live where buses actually go. And uh, the ability to provide 10 cents a mile transportation for people to become gainfully employed would be revolutionary, um, actually outside the cities, let alone inside the cities. Saving lives. Um, you know, right now, over 40,000 people die on American roads. 1.3 million people die a year in car accidents. And that's going up probably going up because of our phones, okay? Because this is what people would rather do. They'd rather drive hundreds of mi uh, you know, 100 miles down a highway in a thousand, couple thousand pound piece of metal and look at their email and die. So it matters. And it's uh, under 40, it's probably the biggest uh, cause of killers. Uh, just this statistic. This is an epidemic, okay? 1.3 million people in the world. Every day that you accelerated self-driving cars, if 94% of accidents are caused by human error, like once again, you know, assumptions, um, you would save 3,000 lives a day. Now, is there a drug in this world that they would not expedite through the FDA that could save 3,000 lives a day? I don't think so. Why aren't we thinking like that? We have an epidemic, and there's a vaccine. Catalyst for growth. Look, we need to find productivity somewhere. Uh, it's harder and harder to find productivity, and uh, the truth of the matter is that uh, autonomous transportation uh, can provide um, the ability to shrink geography, and of course, shrinking geography is critical um, for, uh, for economic growth. Now, jobs will be lost. We just did a workplace study. You can get it on secureenergy.org that uh, took all these economists and talked about how many jobs will be lost. Now, first of all, the job loss, which is tragic in any sense, but the, the positives, the upside. So it could be worth over a trillion dollars to the U.S. economy every year. That has to do with um, just losses from accidents are in the, uh, I think it's like $800 million a year we lose from accidents in the United States of America based on people losing work time, you know, insurance companies, fixing cars, everything else, um, all the way to just getting goods uh, to places or people having more productive times in their lives. So, uh, although it will cause uh, an incredible amount of disruption, it's just like any creative disruption moment. There are, the, uh, there are the positive sides, but we definitely need to worry about it. I would say in our study, we really saw that um, most of the change is not actually in drivers of cars, it's the drivers of trucks. There is a current truck shortage in the United truck driver shortage in the United States. Um, there's about 85,000 truck drivers we need, which is why the cost of goods is going up currently in this really hot economy. Um, and so, and they're also incredibly, um, they're much older um, itself. So I'm not saying that we should put them out, but a business, but, uh, but it, this will, you know, this is how productivity is made, right? We'll find more productive time with our, with working in the cars or even just relaxing in your car and watching a movie, that, that matters. Um, 
Now, many companies will benefit um, as well. Um, we were talking earlier about you know Verizon because they'll be able to put uh, a lot of movies in your car and Netflix and everything. Yeah, I mean, it is is revolutionary. Now, cars won't look like cars. I can talk about that. That's one of the issues. Now, back to transportation of uh, freight, which is why I bulk goods. I just wanted to uh, bring this up here. And so, it's 2018. They drove this uh, driverless semi-trailer um, in Sweden, and they're starting to carry goods in it. Okay, that's pretty incredible. Now, this is actually not self-driven. This is um, this is actually remotely driven. So they drove this. I think they were sitting in Silicon Valley, and it was being driven in Sweden. Now, um, why that matters is, as I said before, or I might not say it, the cost of moving goods is a function of uh, equipment, fuel, and labor. So, of course, you're taking a gigantic component out of the shipment of goods. Now, um, this is really important. So, as I said before, trucks, like, yeah, they carry bulk, but they do it really poorly. So, it costs to go from England to Jacksonville for, like, a container, $400, okay? From Jacksonville to Miami, it costs $700. So if, okay, and so if you have driverless, electric, which that is, uh, movement of goods, you've solved the fuel and cost question uh, for labor question in moving goods around. So therefore, where we have a society where, of course, as I said, bulk goods ship on water, so of course we have coastal elites, <laughs> and uh, that's where a lot of economic activity, you could see a world where, like, it doesn't matter if you build something in Siberia, because it doesn't cost you anything to get it to, uh, to the coast. So it really reorients how you might build and where you might build. Now, lots of other reasons people build. But the non-coastal <laughs> uh, elite uh, would maybe benefit from all this. Um, now, this little puppy is, uh, is also kind of important. Now, I'm skeptical on, like, do humans want this? What will happen? I I'm not here to say that everyone, and I, I got that. But this little guy is important because 300 billion miles a year, right, are, driven, are, are trips that are, um, sorry, 300 billion trips a year uh, in the United States are driven less than two miles for shopping. Shopping. So if you were able to change your delivery to this, so once again, it could come in a big pod, big truck, electric truck and pod, could be a drone maybe, um, one, you would save one billion gallons of fuel billion gallons of fuel. It's like, it's unbelievable. So, um, and like I said, I haven't touched on drones or now you hear about flying a helicopter from the airports or not. So then I said, will this be a straight road? And I said, uh, you know, what will happen? Well, let me just say, who will fight back? Now, I come from Washington, D.C. This is the way I think of the world. Who is going to fight back? And basically, I've posited that this will be the greatest reorientation of, uh, of how we uh, organize our societies. Well, there's a lot of companies, businesses, and uh, even ideological interests that I'll go through that really think about this. Now, I only have a list of uh, maybe uh, 10, it looks like, people, but just expand from there. Um, and we're seeing that now in Washington because there's a piece of legislation called the AV Start Bill that I can talk about. So first of all, insurance companies. It's pretty bad for them, no crashes. Um, they clearly are worried. Now, in the short term, it's really good for them because if they get driver assist type of technology and cut crashes but still charge us the same amount, because they do a pretty poor job at the moment pricing the savings that we're getting by all the new technology that are put into our cars. We've got oil companies. I'll add oil countries to that scenario, and they have a lot of influence. Um, we've done actual, uh, we've had an actual um, focus groups and uh, polling what is amazing is if you tell someone all the benefits of self-driving, like I listed some of them to you, but you went through it exhaustively, and then you told them all the negatives of it, um, you know, like people will steal my data, they'll have create terrorism, uh, you know, I'll just go through the list that they might say. Um, I would say that the negative, we know that the negatives actually go up higher than the positives. So if you're against this, it's much easier to drive a negative argument because humans are more skeptical of a change and scared of it. Metro systems, right? So um, I just discussed one uh, 10 cents a mile. I talked about giving free, you know, one of the crazy things like we're dealing with now is like we have empty buses that drive routes empty. That's like actually your worst mile per vehicle, passenger vehicle mile 
um, in, in many, in many, in, in the world. So if you can actually, like, why don't we just take these vehicles and slap an M on them? And that would be your metro system. Um, now, you know, the metro system might, is starting to do that here and there. They're trying these things, but, you know, are they really capable of sustaining the system they have while there's this rapid change? Look, hospitals, I'm not saying hospitals want people to be dead, but they, uh, you know, uh, one of their greatest, uh, that's where they, their car crashes, injuries. This is something they do. And on, on, the, on the negative side, I mean, organ donation is going to have a big impact on that. Um, You've got to think about that. Uh, car rental companies, I already discussed uh, their problems. Trial lawyers, they're actually the people who have stopped the AV legislation um, currently. They, uh, you know, they don't want that. Um, actually, one I didn't put up there are, you know, uh, people who fix cars. Uh, um, the Teamsters, another one. Um, you know, of course, look, this is all difficult for uh, change is difficult, but, uh, you know, they, they want to stop it. Now, uh, actually, the truth is that this is actually make their lives better. Being a trucker is a lifestyle. It's actually not a job. It's a very difficult lifestyle. And um, it's funny that, uh, that um, company I showed you that does the teledriving, they actually use Uber drivers because they want people who know the cities. It, it's likely, in my mind, that there'll be, every car will be connected to humans somewhere um, to deal with those edge cases and they'll take over, and maybe it's one human with like 10 you know, cars, and there'll be like an air traffic control type of setting, and they'll take over if uh, something. I, I think uh, both, I bet you it will be legislated, because it'll just make people feel more comfortable. You can push a button, and there's a human there to take over. So there are new jobs. There are different types of jobs. There's also like you could sit in these vehicles as they drive themselves and do other work, such as um, you know, inventorying and everything else. But you know, it, it is a change. Uh, parking garages, man. I just had a lot of I had a lot of meetings this morning. We talked about you know the, the heat trap over cities. You know how much land we use like for parking. Like the amount of land we use for parking is unbelievable. If you are a real estate magnet, you got to be worried about this because you have to ask yourself what is going to happen to all that free space. And in fact, there are there are um, you know very few, but architecture companies and others who are starting to think like, okay, how do I build a building that doesn't like ramp up, but has more flat so that I can convert it into something else um, as this sort of takes over. Regional airlines. Why would I go through the airport if I can get into my living room? A pod that feels like my living room and I can sit back, go to sleep, wake up and I'm in another city. I mean, it's just, uh, I just don't think the, uh, the, the TSA can compete with that, that idea. The ideological left, it's amazing to me. This is the most amazing thing in Washington. Who's against this? The safety advocates, the environmentalists, the consumer groups. Okay, like if you're a safety advocate, like this could save more lives. This is Ralph Nader. Um, Ralph Nader used to say in the 1970s that car companies were killing people because they refused to put technology in the cars, right? And I just wrote a letter to the Wall Street Journal that said the exact opposite. Ralph Nader's kind of killing people because he's refusing to let them put technology into cars, like driver assistant congestion mitigation technology. And so I think that this is a big problem. Um, and what you see is a hardening you know, in, the, in our political system. And how do we keep this out of that sort of left-right divide? Um, look, Dianne Feinstein is leading the charge against this AV start bill. Like, all these companies, if, you, if the person who's in charge of California and Silicon Valley you know, can't be for this innovation, like, there, there's an issue. Um, you know, many of the environmental groups are, are concerned, and I get that. Um, you know, they want, some of them say, like, okay, you cannot have an autonomous vehicle unless it's electric and shared. I understand that, too. But I think that we are too early in the revolution that we have to determine what the business models or how this will actually work. We need to give it time to to thrive. And look, if things are bad, that's why we have governments. That's why they are supposed to make decisions. But right now, they should not predetermine. Um, what's frustrating a little bit here is, um, look, if you believe that our species is about to go extinct, uh, which many of the organizations who are against this, what do they want? They want fuel economy standards, which I want too. But that's going like running in a football analogy. You're on your 10-yard line. There's 30 seconds left, and you're running the ball down the field. You're never going to get to the end. You've got to throw some balls. And these technologies really are uh, put us in a position to do something dramatic um, in the transportation space, which is uh, the fastest growing um, source of emissions, at least in the United States. 
and the ideological right. Um, clearly, uh, two things uh, matter here. Uh, one is um, this idea of, like, I want to be able to go wherever I want to go. I don't want a robot. I'm, and I'm not saying all these cars will be self-driving either, So, but that's really the notion uh, that they have. Um, also, big government, big data. Um, you know, I think that many of them are concerned that Michelle Obama will be the president. She'll have some fitness campaign, and, like, you're overweight, and you want to go get a Slim Jim at 2 in the morning, and you'll order your car, and say, no, you're overweight. You're not allowed to go to 7-Eleven to go to Slim Jim. Uh, the funniest line I heard uh, in this whole thing is uh, someone said, so the companies who are developing these technologies are all left wing. They know what sites we go to. They know how we vote. It's changed the algorithm and bye-bye voter, <laughs> democratic voter. So, uh, you know, people, we live in a society where people think strange things. Now, as I said in the beginning, is this going to be a straight road or are we going to hit a wall? This must have been a democratic voter. Uh, Sorry, that Republican voter that the uh, that people over at uh, Google wanted to. I'm, oh, if this is recorded, Google doesn't do that. I apologize. I don't want to be sued by anyone. Anyway. But is it going to be us yes, hitting a wall, or are we going to have an open road ahead? So I think uh, thank you very much for having me. I love to take questions. I think they told me 40 minutes and 20 minutes for questions. Perfect. Over there. One of your first slides you had, uh, you know, is this the best we can do? And you showed some congestion. Can, can, can you, you speak up a little? Yeah, I'll speak more directly in the microphone here. One of your first slides said, is this the best we could do? And you showed a lot of congestion. But uh, from my understanding, uh, automated cars with no people in them will only increase the amount of cars on the road and therefore increase congestion. Right. So I'm going to play a little video because it's hard to, like, see this. Now, once again, this is a made-up video. Um, true is I don't disagree with that notion. Like clearly, uh, a lot of people believe if we do not get sharing, then we're we're in trouble. But I would say the ability to create efficiency by you know spacing vehicles you know incredibly close and doing all these other things is really opens up the throughput in uh, in our society. But here's our uh, here's our video. <laughs> By the way, I didn't place that question in the crowd. I one didn't know how to work this in, but I appreciate the question. I mean, I think to me the uh, the, the question there is there's um, uh, you know, we don't know yet all these things, but we do know that sensors and the ability to stack um, things. I, I just drove from uh, Washington D.C. to Buffalo, take my daughter to um, to a hockey tournament, and I think I touched my I have driver assist. And I think I touched my, and I don't even have like autopilot or whatever the Tesla has. And I didn't touch my brake or my acceleration eight times. And what it was doing, it was most efficiently spacing me to the car in front of me. And actually, it was the car behind me I was most worried about. But the car in front of me, and if a car you know pulls in, then you know you slow down. And it's that ability to, um, in, when we, this is something I've been talking to people in Washington about. Like when we talk about cost of infrastructure. I mean, the real question is, like, do we really want to build another road, for example, in Washington on I-66 um, for, you know, $5 billion, or could we just put sensors in all our cars in the bus, like current sensors that have V2V -V communication, and thus stack our cars you know, much closer together? You know, the other side of that argument, of course, is if there is availability of space, someone always takes it. So, uh, but I, I think, uh, to me, we just did a study at Securing America's Future Energy that showed system-wide impacts of current technology, V to I, V to V, uh, driver assist and congestion mitigation, could save between 18 and 25% fuel and 9,000 lives on the road. 
You know, the amazing thing there is the current fuel economy standards that we're all debating do not allow, actually bans any of those technologies to be, cre to be considered um, as saving fuel um, as part of the standards. Well, what happens if we incentivize companies to expedite? Uh, it takes about, uh, we did some, uh, when you look at new technologies, it takes about 25 uh, years to, um, you know, they start at the high-end cars and they, you know, begin to, you know, go down. Um, what happens if we created an opportunity to uh, put these sensors in, uh, in cars now and there was, a, you know, an economic uh, advantage to the companies? I mean, that could save, that's on the order of seat belts and it's, uh, as a percentage of savings, it's, uh, it's much bigger than uh, every percentage a year they're going to get. Um, hi, so I have a question regarding, like, you were talking about how you think that uh, AV would be able to, like, help, like, a disadvantaged regions where like public transit doesn't really cover very well. So could you elaborate on that idea and how the economics works out? Because it seems to me that just because you switched a human driver with an AI driver doesn't necessarily mean the bus routes are going to change. So, so just so I, I, I didn't totally uh, hear, it was a little garbled. Is that uh, how tra transit, that was a transit question? Uh, yes. How so, it becomes transit? Yes. Yeah, I mean, so um, if you want to take a good course, do you, have, do you teach a course on this? Uh, Alan uh, teaches a course on this. Um, yeah, the idea is that uh, these car sharing companies, as I said before, uh, mass transit is both despised by most people, right? It's got these people who like want to protect it at all costs. Those are usually people who don't take it, right? But if you talk to people who actually take transit, they don't want to take it. Do you think the person in the city who has to walk to this, have little kids, they hate it. And you're, a, you're a disabled person, it's terrible. And so the truth is that this is a very poor way of getting people around. It was good for its time, but the truth is that we can have much more um, you know, design systems. Um, if you have six people, person cars, or even less, and you've got 10 cents a mile and they're driving around all day, um, they could park when they're not picking someone up. Um, you could get people where they need to go into their jobs and, and transit systems, if the government wants to subsidize that, and as I said, they can make money on the proposition where they currently are, you not only would be providing a service that people might actually like and want, but you could actually be doing it at a cheaper cost to, uh, to government. Now, that's not the way our transit systems for the most part think. They are full of unions and they're full of people who believe we just need big buses and, and everything else. So I really, I think this is like actually one of the areas that is most misunderstood, probably because um, you know voters don't come from those areas, and they're also you know least exposed maybe to some of these uh, changes that can happen. But um, I think it's it's really it's the dramatic change in you know people who are stuck uh, where they are because they can't get it anywhere else. Um, so. I think that I thought I, I do see this as uh, having an uh, impact. Um, there's baby steps, so of course uh, Uber and Lyft, for regulatory reasons, have to work on um, you know uh, on handicapped, disabled you know types of rides. I do I don't I, I don't know how good their job is on that. I mean a lot of it's like they just they have to do it. Now there's a new project of uh, in uh, Berlin I think it is where the the mass transit system is essentially beginning to use. Uh, some of these, uh, some of these technologies, and sort of claiming this is the mass uh, transit uh, system. I think Daimler's company is the one doing that at the moment. So, I think uh, I think there'll be a lot of people trying to stop it and slow it. But I also think here, here's the here's the question, right? The question to me is, can you get enough of them on the road fast enough and working without killing people and not kill people, so then they're banned forever, or for people to create regulatory hurdles? And then people see that there is a better solution out there. And if they see a better solution, likely it won't be stopped. Um, and that, that, is, uh, that is really the, the question that we have now in the race. And you know, what you really see is uh, like Uber and Lyft. The Uber really changed the world in that regard. And I'm not going to speak to the ethics of basically saying, well, I don't need to follow the laws and I'll provide a good to a people. Like our scooter company is sort of doing that, right? Let's just throw scooters everywhere and kids are going to love them. And when, I try to when the city tries to stop it, they're going to be like, no, like revolution. Now, what happens in that scenario is might be argued what happened just in New York where they capped the amount of Ubers and Lyfts. Because de Blasio got you know, creamed by Uber, and it's a very famous story about him trying 
to uh, many years ago trying to stop it. They had all their users, you know, <laughs> going to them, and 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 he, it was like egg on his face. So when he had a chance to, you know, s stick it to them, he did. And uh, what a terrible way for regulators to decide how many vehicles should be in a city. Then we should do something like congestion pricing, right? We should allow the good to be priced, and people will make decisions what to do. But I think. Um, this could be as transformative of any of the reasons to do this. Oh, there was a question here. There's a mic over here. It sounds pretty good it's for gross. cities and urban areas. Yeah. How about the rural areas? So I actually think we spend too much time talking about cities, mm -hmm. and we spend less time talking about suburbs and rural. I think in those areas, this can actually be more dramatic and helpful. Because, like, if you're in a city, like, you do have that bus. I might have just, like, said it was terrible and everything else. But there is a way to get around. Um, these solutions come. But Uber and Lyft have fundamentally changed people's ability in the outer boroughs. So we just did a study that showed, if you look at it, you know, there's this, there's this feeling like this is just for rich people or this is, um, but really the truth is that wealthy people had access to rideshare or um, hired vehicles, TNC, and so did actually um, some of the p poor neighborhoods. But the, the people, the middle class, did not. And what it's fundamentally done is allowed people to get vehicles to get them into cities to actually come to the city to, uh, to do it. So, you know, I, I, we started working with elderly people a while back at Securing America's Future Energy, and the most shocking to me when talking to elderly experts, like their biggest challenge is what they call orphaned elderly. Yes. It's incredible. And so I think you have a few of these vehicles. These vehicles actually are not that expensive. That's the point, too. And they could just be sitting there, and they'll be ready for the, uh, the, uh, the urban, uh, urban user. Um, you know, if you look at the data, and also the hockey stick of this, which uh, we talked a lot about today. I mean, so that in 2015, I said, like, that was the first autonomous vehicle on a public road. Okay? So just look at Waymo's purchases now. Right? Uh, people have, uh, smarter than me have looked into this. But you know, in the first year they bought two. Then they bought uh, a year later 20. Then they bought 200, you know, a year later. And then they bought just like, before they bought 62,000. Wow. So they're, every time you change the algorithm because you learn something, every car doesn't have to start learning at 16 years old again. So I just think, uh, Look, I, I think that this is not a question of technology. I'm not an engineer, once again. I always say that. Um, yes, it is very hard to go from point A to point B. Some people think it's easier than others. Hard. But I think it's not, that's not going to be the challenge. I figure they'll figure that out. The challenge is going to be the people, the, the politics, the ideology, the you know, change. Because it is so disruptive. And if you can, like, I think Waymo is very smart. They put their cars in Phoenix, and they're getting people to have these rides, and, you know, people are shopping. And, you know, they're not perfect yet, right? They, what do they say? They drive like old people? Although I've had an old uh, Uber driver that was pretty funny. I was like, it's like my grandmother driving me. Um, so they, but at the same time, I mean, for them, it's, uh, it, you know, people, people like it. Um, and they're just going to get better. Like I said, every time they get a little better. So then the question is, what are car companies going to compete? Are car companies going to compete? Are they going to become sharing companies? Are sharing companies going to become car companies? You know, that's the real question. Everyone's a friend of you right now. They invest in each other. They hate each other. Um, are car companies going to compete on um, what it feels like to drive? Who is the most human? Do we want, actually, do we want these to feel like robots driving? We want them to feel like humans driving. I mean, these are, like, we don't know that type of thing. Uh, is there a point where a company is not safe enough? And that's it. You're done. So please. Uh, so thank you for the talk. You, um, you had discussed how this will, along those lines, revolutionize the possibility of transport for people with disabilities. But I do wonder, you know, there are so many different people with different kinds of disabilities, physical as well as mental, who will have different needs for uh, adaptations for being able to use cars. And presumably those people will require cars of their own if it's no guarantee that every single car will have the full range of uh, adaptations required for the broadest swath of the population. So the question is like, 
alluding to the title, you know, are we on autopilot? Are we just going to be repeating the same mistakes in terms of not making the physical cars themselves accessible while simply just putting self-driving or uh, driverless features in them? And uh, at the same time, like from a specific uh, perspective, you know, if someone needs help getting into a car, needs a little more time getting into a car and stuff like that, usually you'd have a person controlling the car and, you know, a person opening the doors and stuff like that. And that alludes to what you were getting at with the decrease in the crew requirements of transportation. So I'm curious as to your thoughts about the uh, uh, ramifications of all of those issues. This might seem like a technical point, right. but I am concerned that if we don't really think this through, we won't have actually advanced anywhere at the end of the right. day, on that front at least. So uh, I have many thoughts and experiences uh, working with companies in this uh, area. So the number one thing to say is one of our problems at the moment in my mind is, you know, the way we allow people to build vehicles is very constrictive, right? You have to have a steering wheel. You have to have the mirrors. It has to weigh a certain amount. And the truth is that it could be a dystopian world if we basically put these technologies in the current vehicles. What is really interesting is the Federal, Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Authority that's you know, existed, that tells you all these things, that's got to change. That should actually just be prescriptive. Like, essentially, like, if a car is this safe, or a vehicle, or a pod, or whatever it may be, is this safe, you can do it. Like, we're not going to tell you what it should look like and, and everything else. So I think that that is a big problem, and um, that is an incredibly hard change. And one reason I think you see um, you know, car companies versus uh, the tech companies having sort of different views on either legislative and regulatory approaches is like car companies have different regulations than someone who maybe puts a sensor on top of a car, a currently existing car. And why is it that people haven't really, and GM deserves credit here, because GM is the only company that we are redesigning one of our entire um, car production lines to build cars without steering wheels and, uh, and pedals. That's a big change. But other than that, like, yes, like, Waymo and everyone is just putting it on normal cars because the regulatory is so much easier. It's already regulated, and that would be a bad thing. So that's number one. Those are the types of changes we need to start thinking about today to happen. Number two is working with groups that have different uh, needs. So like work with the National Federation for the Blind or um, other groups like that. Yes, yeah, their biggest concern, and, and, and I totally share this concern with them, which is you know, they're sort of being used in some ways. Like, this is really important, and you should have sympathy. Because uh, these people can't get around. And then the question is, like, yeah, but in the end, are we going to have the cars designed for us? And I think there has to be a really healthy discussion between those companies. Because the companies do not believe every vehicle will be designed for every disability. It's just not going to happen. But you can't raise the expectations. Now, you know, um, when I met the National Federation for the Blind the first time, they said, like, what was very frustrating about phones is, like, everything's always retrofitted. And it's not good. So we need to have these discussions up front. And I think that's an area where both companies need to learn what's needed, but also there has to be a realistic expectation of what, uh, of what they plan to you know, put out there. Um, now, you can, I mean, this is on the elderly side. I mean, if you're a hospital system, like we did a study that showed how much money you could save in a healthcare cost, because people miss their appointments, can't get to their appointments, and everything else. So I do see a fleet of vehicles with attendants in the back who might not be driving, but actually starting your appointment right there. Um, and actually have a well-paid job as a, you know, a nurse practitioner, or maybe in certain cases they're not even that uh, sort of that that uh, that that, uh, that trained. But I think there's a whole sort of fleet of cars, and uh, that could be doing that. And then my final um, thought is about ownership. So I talked a lot about sharing. I I personally am not convinced that it will all be sharing. Um, I do believe that humans probably want to own something. And if the price is not astronomical, so let's say even if it's 80000 a car, but you currently, American families own three cars, or they own two cars, right? So 67% of Americans own two or more cars, 35% uh, of Americans own like three or more cars. Because, uh, uh, and this is per household with <laughs> two drivers. So, uh, and so the answer to that question is, well, you'd, you'd get rid of all your other cars, because I have one autonomous car, could take me to work, then take my spouse to work, take my kids to school, go do all my errands during the day. Like, so I showed those little pods. I'm thinking, like, maybe it's not those pods. Maybe it's like, 
Yeah, Amazon is going to own the world. Why did they buy Whole Foods? Because your car is now going to be designed, or your personal pod with a fridge and a hot box, and it's going to like drop you off at work during the day, drive into like this, this Whole Foods depot, put your dinner, refrigerate your groceries. Like They won't come in your house without you wanting them in there. right? I think that's potentially odd. And yeah, you'll get to your car, and everything will be there, dry cleaning and, and everything, and it'll be owned. And like people love throwing their stuff in their car. So I do think that the price point will allow, if one looks at LIDAR, LIDAR costs or camera costs and everything else, that there's a potential that there's more ownership than uh, I'm sure a lot of people think is healthy um, in this space. Um, so everything you're saying is great and all. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I have, I guess, one slight concern. As you take, as you put transportation sort of on autopilot, people have less and less agency in their own travel. Mm -hmm. How do you keep people who develop this sort of, um, you know, driverless cars ethical? Like, say, so I, I know a big thing is for election day, like Lyft and Uber saying, like, if you can't get to your polling place, we'll give you a ride for free. Now, say personal transportation, you know, becomes less and less popular, and then we depend on these sort of car companies to drive us around. Mm -hmm. Like, what prevents them on election day saying, like, oh, I'm sorry, there's no transportation today? And then people can't vote. Uh, well, first of all, I think a lot of people have problems getting to their, uh, to their polling places now, and a lot of people don't even want to vote. But let's just assume that uh, Americans suddenly decide they want to vote. I mean, I don't have an answer to that question. I think that sort of speaks to my, uh, I guess, on the right side, their view that, uh, you know, that you, look, we have just a scary moment here, too, right? Uh, the dystopian moment that like a few companies are owning all this data and they know where you're going and all these things, they know what you're buying. And I, I, I share those concerns in society and I think you know good protections on data are is actually the most, probably one of the most critical things here is gonna be how do you ensure that, two things, that people trust that these will not, uh, that these will be safe. And how do we communicate that in a human way? Because I'm sure there's a lot of engineers here. Most people don't understand what an algorithm is. Okay, and saying like, oh, the algorithm worked or didn't work, doesn't matter. Like, they want to know, is this as safe as the average driver? Is this 100 times safer than the average driver? Like, we need to figure out, as a society, how safe we want these things. Um, is it just safer than the average driver? And then that will be, you know, a metric that can be measured. And the other one is this data question. Now, of course, we've got phones that you can track people and credit cards and tolling and everything else, but that doesn't matter. I think this is fundamental, like if I'm going somewhere, um, people. So people have to trust uh, the, the data, that data sharing um, use. That didn't answer your question, but I don't really have an answer to your question because I can't speak for them. I, I just, they want to make money. I imagine they'll get people those voting places. Okay, I will uh, stop there, and I appreciate everyone's time, and I'm happy to talk to you after, or just you can get my contact information from the school here, and just send me an email if you want internships or anything else, please. We're in Washington. So great